Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 267, recorded September 28th, 2016, for October 3rd, 2016. Trisha Hirschberger. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash triangulation. This is Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the smartest and most interesting people on the internet today. Leo Laporte usually hosts, as I'm sure you know. He is on vacation on a boat somewhere. I am taking over, and today my guest is Trisha Hirschberger. She's a YouTuber. She's a gamer. She's an actress. She is a producer, and I'm so excited to talk to her. Uh, Trisha, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good for Leo being on vacation, huh? That's awesome. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, he said he was going to take no technology, but I've been watching his Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm very jealous. That's, that's that's why we go on vacation these days, right? To, to make people jealous on social media. Absolutely. Well, Megan, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here. Um, the, the lead in of some of the most interesting and smart people on the web. I was like, oh, man, maybe I should tag somebody else in. For this. <laughs> but seriously, thank you. And I have to say you are also uh, one of the nicest people on the Internet. You know, I feel I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character. And I feel like, uh, you know, with YouTube, it's pretty hard to fake um, being like a genuine, authentic person and just watching your stuff. I feel like that really comes through. Uh, I don't want to go to fangirl on <laughs> this show, but I love your work. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a special challenge to be a, a young woman, uh, on the internet in this space. Uh, and I think that you do a really great job of doing that. So, um, yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to people not being genuine on YouTube, I feel like the YouTube audience has grown in such a way that it can smell fake from a mile away. So if you're not being you, um, I, I don't know how long that's going to be uh, that that's going to be viable when it comes to creating a YouTube presence for yourself. Like it's the thing that I like so much about it is that it is all about being you. I came from the world of traditional media. I had a theater degree and I wanted to come out to Los Angeles and play characters and get cast in stuff. And because a lot of Hollywood casting directors and agents had a hard time kind of fitting me in their predetermined cookie cutter roles, they didn't really know what to do with me. And YouTube was a great space for me to be able to say, you know, no, this is just who I am. It may not fit a certain idea or image of what you think someone should be, but that's okay. And YouTube gave, gives lots of people a platform to be that unique individual and and you will then cultivate an audience based on that, which is a beautiful thing. Now, do you feel like you were one of the first generation, let's say, that that really realized that YouTube was a place, an alternative to just constantly going to casting calls and, you know, doing acting jobs, doing commercials? I know you do a little bit of both, but do you feel like um, you were one of the pioneers um, as a career YouTuber? Uh, you know, there's a bunch of us out there that work in YouTube that call ourselves the olds. <laughs> um, and it, it's because we're of that like prior, we're, we're not the current 14 year old bloggers that have millions of subscribers. We did that before. I wouldn't say the first generation. I would say maybe the, the second or 2.5 generation. You know, there are people who started back in 07, 08. Um, and that those are your, your I just scenes, your Philip DeFranco's. Um, and, I started roughly uh, 2012, 2011, 2012. So it's been about a five year journey for me so far. But in YouTube time, like it's like in dog years, in YouTube years, that's old. <laughs> Uh, so well, let's let's back up a little bit. I know uh, in your childhood, I've heard you describe yourself as a as a tomboy. Um, describe a little bit what it was like growing up, like a, a girl who loved gadgets, loved video games. What was that like? 
Yeah, so I grew up um, really being into the outdoors at first. And so I was really into archery and climbing trees and I was hurt like all the time and I'd fall in the creek several times a year. And, uh, you know, my toys were Ninja Turtles and Ghostbusters. They weren't Barbies and My Little Ponies. And so because of that, I tended to make more friends that were guys than that were girls. Um, And I know my mom, because I was the oldest, was like, Oh, I hope this is normal (laughs) Um, because she just hadn't experienced any other little girls in her life that were kind of, you know, into these things. And she was pushing me in a watch Care Bears. That's not violent. Please stop watching violent shows. Um, But it just it was what I was into. And um, that very quickly turned into uh, a gaming habit, video games in particular. I always liked tabletop games and board games, but I would say around the age of five or six, I jumped into video games. Um, and then because my parents were kind of like, Hey, maybe that's not the healthiest activity for you to do all the time, because it was still very early in the eighties when they were just starting to have home consoles. Uh, you know, I, I could see parents being like, well, this is the new technology. Maybe it's bad. Um, they refused to buy me any more consoles after the original NES. And then I had to transition into PC gaming because we had to have a computer for the house for schoolwork. <laughs> Um, and then that made me quickly realize this, this really dates me, but four megabytes of Ram was not enough to run doom. (laughs) And so at a very young age, I was like, well, I need to upgrade my Ram. How do I do that? Let me figure it out. And I kind of all started from there and I never looked back. (laughs) So that's a good lesson to parents. If you want uh, your child to grow up understanding technology, don't do anything for them. Let them do it themselves. (laughs) (laughs) Let let them figure it out. It'll be fine. Um, And I have to say, my dad was pretty right there with me the whole time. And I was like, dad, we got to sit down. We got to talk about this. We have to upgrade this PC because I need to play this and this and this and this and this. And he was like, all right, well, let's figure out how to do that. So we kind of <laughs> discovered computers together. It was lovely. <laughs> so what were your first favorite uh, PC games? Oh, gosh, way back in the day. Um, well, I enjoyed Doom, but it was a little bit too scary for me. So I could only play in like 15 minute increments and then I had to tap out. Um, but uh, the Monkey Island games, the old school point click King's Quest games, Zork, Return to Zork. Um, way back, if I could get my hands on any text-based adventure games, that was really cool. Um, again, totally dating myself here, Oregon Trail. Um, and then as I got older, the Mist series, so Mist, Riven, all of that kind of stuff is just right up my alley. Absolutely adore it. Great stories, um, puzzle solving, really, really fun stuff. Well, so I, I watched an interview with you and uh, Ashley Skada, who's another one of my favorite yeah, gaming she's great. ladies. Uh, and you talk, it was an interview at CES, CES and you talk about how uh, you started uh, as a booth babe, that you, back in the day, <laughs> you were a booth babe. And it, you said yes. that it, it hurts your heart when people criticize birth, booth, booth babes. <laughs> talk a little bit about that. It does. Well, and you know, you can call it booth babe. You can call it product uh, specialist, brand ambassador. Um, Some people are offended by the term booth babe. I don't happen to be. But basically, it's being a hired spokesperson for a specific company or for a specific convention. And I did do a lot of that work because as someone who was trying to work consistently in the entertainment industry, anything you're doing that's presentational is helping you refine and hone those skills. And for me, I couldn't get into CES because it's industry only. I couldn't get into Comic-Con because it's expensive unless I was working the convention. So being a booth babe gave me the opportunity to actually go to these big events I was excited for. And, you know, I I got to learn and see new products and it, it was a wonderful experience for me. And I think it's a common misconception that when people think of the term uh, booth babe, and I think this is why people don't like that term, is that they think, you know, these are just people that are hired for their looks. They have no idea what they're talking about. And it's like people get a reaction where it's like, it's offensive to me that this person is here because I'm here for the subject matter and they are obviously not. And I think that that judgment of saying these people are obviously not, that's what hurts my heart because I've met many women and men. Men can be product ambassadors too. Um, I've met many women and men who are there because they do love the subject matter of what the convention is. And 
they enjoy being there. And I mean, I, one of the years I worked for, uh, actually a lot of years I worked for Comic-Con, I worked for Mattel and uh, their MattyCollector.com site where it's all the adult collectibles. If you're going to pay me money to talk to people for 10 hours a day about really awesome toys that I'm excited to buy when they come out, that is a-okay with me. And if that means that on my lunch break, I get to go and take a glimpse of a signing or a panel or something I really wanted to see, that's even better. That's a job I look forward to all year. And I think that there are more people out there who feel that way, especially nowadays, they're being more vocal about it uh, than not. So I just hate to see that judgment come in. I've been at CES years where, you know, I'm standing in front of, I don't know, a new monitor, let's say, and I want to tell people all about this new monitor and why it's exciting. And people would come up to me and say, uh, excuse me, I need to ask someone some questions about this monitor. And I'd say, great, you know, I'd, I'd love to tell you all about it. And they'd say, yeah, but do you actually know what you're talking about? <laughs> and it's that attitude that hurts my heart. Because I'm like, well, yes, sir, actually I do. But thank you for assuming that I'm an idiot. Would you <laughs> like me to introduce you to the janitor? Maybe he would be able to answer your questions. Um, so it gives, it, it gives me that like gut reaction of, please don't judge people that you know nothing about. Go and go to enjoy the convention. And of course, I'm sure you will encounter people, both employees that are permanent employees for that company and people who are just doing spokesmodel work um, that maybe don't have all the answers to your questions, but I bet they're trying. And if through a conversation you can educate each other, even better. Now, that's part of why I feel like podcasting and YouTube has been such a great venue for women uh, in technology, because I think that instead of waiting for someone to come up to us and ask us the questions, we get to deliver the information. We get to say, you know, here's what I know and here's, you know, here's me talking about it. Do you feel like uh, that has been helpful to you in your uh, career? Most definitely. Um, so before I was making YouTube videos, I was actually working in Samsung's IT department as part of their marketing. And I was going into retail stores and training all of the employees on the new product lineup that was coming up and telling them why it's exciting and how to talk to their customers. And um, I would always get that, you know, that at first, like, oh, you are not what I expected from Samsung's IT group. Uh, but then after people got to know me, it was totally commonplace and normal. And they look forward to me coming in and, you know, just talking, talking tech with them all day. And I feel like having a platform that distributes worldwide, like YouTube, like podcasts, is letting that happen on a greater scale. And for me, when I transitioned then into making videos that people worldwide could watch, yes, probably the first couple times they see me, they would say, that's not what I expected to come out of her mouth. Um, but after that, they were like, oh, yeah, that's Trish. She tells me about this and that and the other thing in the tech world. And they were totally OK with it. Yeah, I think you do an amazing job of walking. Well, it's really a fine line between talking smartly about technology, geeky, gaming, you know, comics, that kind of stuff, and also being very attractive and approachable. And so, I mean, what are some oh. of the challenges there? <laughs> <laughs> How sweet of you. Um, I, You know, I think that the challenge is that anytime you are other than what the preconceived norm is in a specific area of entertainment, people are naturally going to feel like something's wrong here. Um, and and that's, that's, a very, uh, that's a very natural response for people to have. When they see something they don't expect, you know, people are like, well, well what is this? There must be a reason for this. Um, and I, I think that just by being inherently yourself and by being genuine over time, people will understand that, okay, that's just what that is now. And maybe expand their horizons a little bit, whether it's because you are a different gender, a different look, a different sexual orientation, a different age, a different race, whatever it may be. If you're anything other than the norm, you're going to have challenges there. But the more of us speak out and show who we are, I think the more that that preconceived norm will hopefully fade away. And I feel like you'd also do that with your community online. Um, you know, you, we always talk about Reddit and YouTube being this horrible place. Everyone's always, you know, criticizing. I read the uh, Reddit AMA that you did a few years ago. And, you know, there were commenters who were saying, you know, thank you for talking about depression. You really helped me. You helped me get help. Um, you know, there's people that you inspire on YouTube. Um, what are some ways that you do that? How do you inspire your community in that way? 
I think that it's important to remind people that even though the people who shout the loudest a lot of times on these forums like Reddit or 4chan or sometimes YouTube may be the angry people and the people that are lashing out that even though those are the louder comments, there is a there is a silent majority out there that doesn't feel that way. And I always try to highlight those people and to say to remind the people that are that extraordinarily vocal minority that, uh, you know, I understand that you're doing that because that gets attention and you're thinking that all the other super anonymous, no one will ever find me, uh, internet commenters will be high-fiving you behind the scenes. Um, th that's not really cool. And that doesn't make other people feel good. And it's not just the people who are making the content, but other people who are reading those comments and hanging out in that community. That's not a community they probably want to hang out in. I'm just saying, if I, you know, if I went to a gym all the time where everybody was throwing things and screaming. I probably wouldn't want to go to that gym very often, even if they had amazing gym equipment. Um, you know, so fostering that community is super important and creating a space where people can feel like, hey, I can share my opinion, even if it's opposing with somebody else's opinion. And that doesn't mean we need to escalate things into everyone needs to die and I hope that your mother burns in hell. And, you know, right right now the internet is so hostile with each other and antagonistic all the time. And I just try to reiterate over and over, that's not welcome here in this community. If you want to do that, there are other places that will let you do that. Here, please voice an opposing opinion, but do it in a respectful way that encourages open dialogue. And maybe, just maybe, we'll all learn from each other. Like coming in and shouting your opinion and mic drop and get out, that doesn't help anybody except for make you feel a little bit better about yourself. And that's not okay. Exactly. So do you think since the time you've been doing this, it's gotten uh, worse or better or pretty much stayed the same? How has it changed over time for you, the internet community and, and how uh, people react I think overall it stayed the same, but on a larger scale, in my opinion. Um, you know, it was harder to find a lot of the sites before that were more of the the dark web, so to speak, that were more of the places that you didn't want to go that was kind of breeding that thought that a lot of people would be adverse to. And now with the growth of social media and people just being able to react publicly and instantaneously, we're seeing all the opinions in such an influx. Um, and I think that that's both the good and the bad, or I guess you could say the opinions that maybe you don't find offensive and the opinions that you find offensive. And I think that we've, we've gotten to a place now that worries me a little bit because we've gotten to a place where people think that opinion is different than mine and therefore I don't want to see it. And that's that. I like that the internet still gives us a place to see the opposing opinions. I just wish that people could debate a little bit more intelligently about it. Mm -hmm. But while I'm at it, I wish that I lived in Disney World. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you did work for Di for Disney. Um, I read that online. Uh, what, what did you do for Disney? I waited tables <laughs> for six and a half years for Disney, actually. Um, when I moved to Los Angeles, I grew up on the East Coast, got my theater degree in classical theater, um, and then moved to the West Coast to pursue a traditional acting career. My first day job, well, I guess my my first real day job, but my, my second job technically that I got after I moved out here was waiting tables for Disney. And they had a, at the time, it's closed down since, but they had uh, an ice cream parlor, like an old school soda fountain in Hollywood. And so it was close to where I was living at the time. And it was one of the only table waiting jobs in town that had health, dental and a 401k. <laughs> so yay for Disney. <laughs> and so I stayed there for a long time and they were very, very sweet to me. I loved working there. Uh, any table waiting job where you just get to be happy all the time is perfect for me because that's who I am. I don't know that I'd ever last in fine dining where you have to be like stoic. <laughs> I don't know that that would be for me, but Disney was great. And they were so supportive of my career and everything I wanted to do, auditioning, hosting, creating my own content, theater, anything that I was doing. They were like, yeah, sure. Take the time off. Just get someone to fill your shift. And, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for a more supportive job. They were great. 
So how did you get involved with streaming uh, or YouTube? What were you, some of your first experiences? Was it in uh, game streaming or where was it? So for me, I tripped and fell into the digital space is what I like to say. I was auditioning for everything under the sun because I thought, you know, I'm I'm not too good for any of these jobs. If you want me to dress up in a mascot outfit and dance around on a parade float, I will do that. Like anything that I do could be experience, it could be connections, it could be helping me get closer to where I want to get. And one day I went in on a Saturday from an audition posting that I found online and uh, it just said for online news host. And I was like, all right, cool, online news host. And I went in and I auditioned and I did my news stories. And then they started asking me about video games. <laughs> and they started asking me how much I know about the world of tech. And at the time I was working for Samsung. And so I was like, oh, well, what do you wanna know? As I pulled like two tablets and three phones out of my bag and was like, ta-da. <laughs> um, and so I felt like after they were asking me about video games and movies and tech, that I kind of nailed that audition. And there's sometimes you leave auditions and you think, oh, I should have done this and I should have done that differently. But I left that one and I was like, oh man, that was great. I just thought I was going in for online news hosts, like boring news. And they asked me about all this stuff that I love. And up until that moment, I when I went in for castings, for hosting things and things like that, the people behind the camera would say to me, what do you know about fashion? What do you know about Hollywood gossip? And I. I'll be honest, that those are blind spots for me. I don't know very much. So at that point, the audition would just go. Yeah, you're like, no I should have played with Barbies more. I should have. Um, but this was the first time people were asking me about stuff I was genuinely interested in. And so, yeah, I thought I nailed that. They called me the next day and said, can you come in for a screen test? And that ended up being SourceFed, which was a channel that I worked on for just over three years. And I got in at the very beginning when it was still, I don't know, a month old and no one really knew what it was uh, and stayed there through winning two streamies and it becoming the huge successful channel that it is today. And due to me starting with SourceFed part-time at first as a fill-in host and then eventually full-time and launching their channel SourceFed Nerd, then I fell in love with this online community and this place where I could just be me and that was okay. <laughs> Amazing. And so uh, why did you leave SourceFed? Um, I left SourceFed because I was looking for new challenges. I'd been there three years and we churned out a ton of content. So it was um, on SourceFed Maine at the time that I was working there. I believe their schedule is a little bit different now. But at the time I was working there, we were doing five videos a day on SourceFed Maine, um, Monday through Thursday. And then I think three videos on Fridays, a video on Saturday and a video on Sunday and then three videos a day, Monday through Thursday on SourceFed Nerd, um, a video, one or two videos on Friday, a video on Saturday and a video on Sunday. So just churning out content all the time. And as the talent, we were also um, doing pre-production, we were writing, we were producing certain aspects of our shoots. So we were busy and it just was exhausting <laughs> after that time. And it started to feel too repetitive to the point where I wasn't challenged creatively anymore. And uh, so for those reasons, I was just looking for something different. And uh, the channel was molding and evolving in a way that I was like, you know, I don't know that that I necessarily fit this as much as I did in the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, so I was looking for new challenges and I got the opportunity to work with The Escapist, which is a gaming site that I had appreciated for a long time and been a fan of for a long time. So that was really exciting. And what did you do at The Escapist? Oh my goodness, this is where I had to put on my producer hat. Um, so I was developing new content for Escapist. They were, you know, thinking about kind of changing directives as to this is the type of entertainment their channel had been for a long time. And maybe now they want to transition into this type of entertainment. And so I was, again, cranking out content. <laughs> this is content that no one ever saw because that's what development looks like a lot of times. <laughs> so you're making... Uh, pilot after pilot after pilot that's going through rounds of executive notes and then being redone and rounds of executive notes and then being redone until it's refined to a point where it's greenlit and you can go forward with it. Uh, but for me, I had never been the one-stop shop before. I had done a lot of aspects of it, but this for me is where I had to start my own production company um, which I started at that time in my life. And that was so that I could hire a crew, so that I could hire post-production and pay these people accordingly and 
you know, deal with liability insurance and all of that stuff that comes with being a producer. So I was used to being a creative producer, but not necessarily the one person in charge of it all. So I learned that very quickly, trial by fire. That's kind of how the digital space is. Uh, when I started SourceFed, I went in for a hosting job and my very first screen test day, they were like, okay, so write a script. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm writing too. <laughs> Okay. Um, so you just get thrown into it and you either fall in love with it or you don't. And for me, I've really appreciated the challenges that have been thrown my way. Um, it, there are times when I wish that I had not majored in classical theater because uh, having the ability to perform Chekhov and Shakespeare and Greek tragedy uh, would does maybe not help me as much in what I'm doing now as if I had gotten a TV film production degree. <laughs> that probably would have set me a few years ahead. But I'm lucky that I live in Los Angeles where a lot of those classes are offered. I've made great use of the YouTube space to teach myself all about lighting and cinematography and audio. And I surround myself by a lot of working professionals who I'm constantly asking questions and just learning as much as I can. And that's a really cool position to be in. Do you ever go on auditions for theater work? Oh, I haven't in a long time. Um, the last thing I did, I guess was right after I started SourceFed. Um, but theater, if you're lucky enough to find theater that doesn't necessarily rehearse during the day, during the week, which a lot of theater does, uh, so that wouldn't let you have a full-time hosting job. If you're lucky enough to find theater that is nights and weekends, which sometimes I am, it's very exhausting when you're working all day and then rehearsal all night and working all day and rehearsal all night and then performing on your weekends. And unfortunately, theater in Los Angeles doesn't pay very much, even when it's union. Um, so when you're kind of allocating your time, for me, I thought maybe my time would be better spent creating and producing videos for my own YouTube channel, my own Twitch channel, that would give me a better ROI than doing theater. But I love theater and I hope that at some point I'm able to return to it. So from The Escapist, you moved on to What's News, a news show yes. on Comic-Con HQ. Uh, tell us about that. Comic-Con HQ. Um, so yeah, What's News was really fun. I got the opportunity to work with a lot of people that I really respect in the industry. Um, a lot of people who worked on Attack of the Show back in the G4 days. And uh, the show was produced by Kevin Pereira. And he's a lovely, lovely, kind individual. And I got to co-host the show with Anthony Carboni, who, uh, while he had been a friend of mine from both of us working in YouTube for years, we had never actually co-hosted a show together. So we were super stoked to co-host a show together. My good buddy Steve Zaragoza from SourceFed came over and had his own show on Comic-Con HQ. And I was just thrilled to be working on a channel with people like um, Adam Sessler, Mark Hamill, Kale Anonymous, Michelle Morrow, um, you know, just all, all these people that I was stoked to work with. And Comic-Con HQ um, did just recently cancel What's News and Mostly Harmless and uh, a lot of the shows that I that I really enjoyed watching on the channel. So I hope that the direction that they're going serves them well. And I'm sad that we're not on that ship anymore. But it, we had, for What's News, we had 32 episodes, which is not a bad run. Um, and it was a show where we got to talk about all the things we love. So it was very SNL weekend update, but for nerds. So <laughs> we got to dress up like fancy news anchors and have a fancy news anchor set and play around with camera angles and cheesy zooms. And we, we intentionally had very poor special effects when we had on guests and we were just silly. It was a silly show that aired twice a week talking about the latest things in fandom culture, and it was great. Uh, I should warn you, having done a silly show like that in 2000, um, you know, it doesn't really go away. <laughs> It'll still be there 16 years from now to haunt you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it doesn't haunt you. It just makes everyone think you're that much cooler. Right. <laughs> well, so do you find, I mean, this happens, this is the industry, right? Like yeah. shows get canceled. It's not the end of the world. Do you find, and I mean, an audience get, audiences get really attached. Do you find that your audience follows you from gig to gig? Or is there a lot of just like, oh, well, those are the source fed people. Those are the escapist people. Those are the Comic-Con HQ people. Or are they really your people? Um, I feel that I have a very dedicated and engaged community. Um, you know, it's been interesting in the industry right now to see, when people follow from platform to platform. I would say, hands down, anything else I do 
on YouTube or on Twitch, people are, it's a very easy switch for people. But if you look at um, some of the YouTube personalities who are transitioning to television content, you'll see those communities maybe not jumping over as much because that's a completely different way to view content. And maybe they don't have cable or they can't access that show in their area. And it's the same thing when you go to an SVOD platform like a Comic-Con HQ, uh, where it's it's a platform people aren't used to. So how much of that audience is going to translate over, you never really know. I know I just recently put up a vlog saying, hey, here's what happened with What's News. It's not a thing anymore. I enjoyed it while it lasted. You know, everyone who worked on it was awesome, all of that kind of stuff. And I had a lot of people in the comments, more so than I thought, actually, that were like, oh, I really enjoyed that show. Like, thank you for that content. Um, because it's a new platform and you just, you never know how many people are going to transition. But I, I have a wonderful fan base that as much as, uh, as I can say, you know, Hey, this is a new thing I'm doing. If you have a chance to check it out, I would love your feedback because that's my home team. Like my community is my home team and they're really good about getting back to me. And sometimes they'll say, Hey, I love this new thing you're doing. Sometimes they'll say that humor is not for me, but I'm glad you're having fun. Um, and either way, I appreciate the feedback. It's really nice to see. Well, uh, I am looking forward to talking about your own production company, what you have produced, what you're working on now, and your Naked Truth, uh, where you vlog naked. Um, <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that until, because yeah. uh, we have to thank one of our sponsors. Um, but we uh, we will talk about all of that after we thank our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. This episode is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. If you've ever had to get a mortgage, you know it is painful. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, you have to talk to a lot of people. You have to get dressed in clothes and go out to an office and sign a bunch of papers. You don't have to do that with Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast. It's powerful. It's completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. If you hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork, you don't have to anymore. With Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and your pay stubs with a touch of the button, helping you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your financial situation. With Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this on your phone or your tablet. It's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. So if you are looking to refinance your current mortgage, or if you're looking to buy a home, take a look at Rocket Mortgage today. It's at quickenloans.com. Go to quickenloans.com slash triangulation. That's quickenloans.com slash triangulation. Check it out. See what you think. They are an equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. This is Triangulation. I am here with Trisha Hirschberger. She's a YouTuber. She's an actor. She's a vlogger. She is a producer. She has her own production company. And uh, let's talk a little bit first about your series, Naked Truth, where mm -hmm. you vlog naked from the shoulders up. From the shoulders up. That's, it sounds so much more scandalous than it is, guys. Don't get that excited. Um, and, well, I mean, if you're really into collarbones, then maybe it could be very scandalous. But So uh, you go into the shower, you take a shower, you think about what you're going to talk about, and then uh, you talk about it. Um, and you are here. We're watching a little bit if you're watching this yeah. episode. So you have uh, you wear no makeup. Uh, you don't uh, do anything to your hair and you're just vulnerable. You let it all hang out there. Tell me what, uh, why you started this and, and how's it going so far? Cool. So the Naked Truth really started as my reaction to having, after I got used to YouTube where I get to just be me and that's awesome, I uh, started having people come in and try to dictate who I am. And that's fine when you're embracing an acting role because you're a character. But when you're putting that out there into the public, like, no, this is me, Trisha Hirschberger, and someone else is trying to dictate who Trisha Hirschberger is, that to me was really scary. And so on my own channel, I wanted to do something that was like, nope, this is just me. And I'm not dressed a certain way because people think I have to. I'm not styled a certain way because people think I have to. I'm not expressing certain opinions because people are telling me I should. This is just me, how I am. No makeup, no editing, one take. Um, and 
So the, the nudity aspect of the show actually comes from back when I studied acting. Um, you know, they would say the most vulnerable you ever are is when you're truly naked on stage. And of course, that can mean literally, not literally. Um, but it, it really is a feeling where you have to be 100% OK with yourself to share that. That's that's a very intimate thing. So it's not a sexual thing, at least in my vlogs. I think if I was trying to make it a sexual thing, I, I would be doing it very incorrectly. My framing is all off. How dare I not wear makeup or jewelry? Um, th this is really all about vulnerability and intimacy. And for me, it's like my video diary. It's my way to communicate the things that I'm feeling without fear of judgment or repercussion. And I think that that's why that community is so lovely. And we have discussed all types of things from um, depression and social anxiety to um, anti-bullying, to why we love Game of Thrones, to how you should handle breakups. I mean, just anything that it is that people want to talk about. I take viewer submitted topic suggestions and we just talk about them very honestly. And I am never claiming that my opinion is the right one. It's just mine based on my experiences and what I've been through. And I always look forward to what the Naked Army, their self-named, the Naked Army community has to say and what they think about a certain topic. And more often than not, they educate me because again, everyone's experiences are different. I have community members from all over the world that have grown up in very different situations with very different ideologies than me. And it's, it's fascinating to see. And it's my little baby side project. I don't know that it's ever, you know, when I started my career thinking, this is the show that I want to make. It just kind of, it was very reactionary and it started happening and it hasn't stopped for, gosh, what, almost three years now. The Naked Truth has been going on, but I love it and I value that community so much. And um, I love getting the chance to talk about it because I think there are a lot of people who see the name, The Naked Truth and see the thumbnails and don't watch a single video and just assume it's, you know, being like a webcam girl for attention online and really have no idea what it is. and. Maybe that's my fault for not branding it well enough. I don't know. But I think that when people do take the time to get to see what it is, that they can really appreciate it. I, ho I hope that they can appreciate it. Well, I definitely think people should check it out. Um, and what's amazing about it is, like you said, you have this naked vlogging army. Uh, so people <laughs> actually re respond to you and you all, you call them out. You know, you say thank you all the time to the people and you link to their uh, responses. And I watched some of these and it's amazing because these are people that you can tell they're nervous. You can tell that like this is scary for them. And I believe you should always do things that are frightening for you. And, and you know, they respond and they're also from the shoulder up. And you do a good job. You say, you know, if you're under 18, ask your parents uh, right. explain what this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're not about we're not about showing anything that you know the reaction that we want to get from people is that they feel linked to us and that they feel like we are being vulnerable by sharing these opinions we're not necessarily going for the you know the people that are just looking for um, sexual content. There are plenty of other sites online where you can find that type of material. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I always tell people shoulders up only, please. Like you said, if you're under 18, please get your parents permission and explain to them what this is. And there are members of the naked army that do not so naked, naked truths, whether it's because they're concerned for their job security or whatever it is. And those people still do right out of the shower, no makeup, wet hair, but sometimes they'll have a towel or a bathrobe or something like that. And some people are just like, look, I'm in my car right now and this is the only time I had to film a response, but I wanted to film a response. And that's fine too. Um, it's really just about challenging yourself to be more honest and vulnerable than I think most of us normally are in life. Yeah, I think we could all use a little more vulnerability. That's absolutely true. So how do you, do you ever get like uh, blocked by YouTube? Do you, is there like some kind of nudity re requirement that you have to get around? Uh, no, I mean, be, we're not really showing anything. So, <laughs> so as far as YouTube's concerned, you know, we could all be sitting there in tank tops or towels or something. Um, so I, I don't, I have not had to worry about YouTube blocking anything. I should say, knock on wood, never say <laughs> never. Um, but I believe I've never really looked into it, but I believe YouTube's rule is as long as it's, uh, not sexualized nudity, it's okay. I'm not sure. Uh, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> that's at least, that's at least been my 
my idea of what the rule is, but I've, I've never worried about it because our show is really so innocent. <laughs> Yeah, I know that there was some recent, you know, issue with them blocking things that were just about homosexuality or things that, you know, an algorithm was basically looking at these things and not understanding. No, this is about vulnerability. So I just yeah. wondered if you had encountered that. And I'm glad it's I well, think these are really highly monetized videos that that were getting caught this way. So, yeah, well, and and also, um, you know, the fear with the YouTube changes was that, you know, it was like, a video that's discussing homosexuality would be pulled or a video that's discussing controversial political matters would be pulled. And we, we discuss that kind of stuff on The Naked Truth all the time. So I would be much more concerned that the video would get pulled because of the subject matter we're talking about being controversial in nature more so than it getting pulled for um, the nudity. So tell me about your production company. Uh, why did you start it and what kind of videos are you doing? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my production company is called Fun Sized Vids uh, because I make videos that are shorter in length and I am also very short. So I thought <laughs> Fun Sized Vids was a great way to go. And um, I produce all different types of content. And, you know, once I left SourceFed and wasn't under the umbrella of Discovery Communications, which is the company who um, came to buy and run SourceFed after years, uh, you know, I now had to look at getting my own production insurance. I had to look at paying my own employees. And when you come at it from the talent angle and from, uh, especially as a YouTuber, you think, well, of course I'm a one-stop shop. I just film everything myself and I edit everything myself. And if I want any graphic design or whatever, I do that myself. And here you go, I made a video. But as this industry has started to become more commercialized and companies want to get in on that, they're usually looking for higher production value or a more professional look than most people may be used to churning out. And for that type of thing, I cannot be both behind the camera and in front of the camera at the same time. I can't be listening to my own audio. It's, it's very difficult to do all that when I'm trying to produce something for another client. So when I got to the point in my career where I was producing things for other clients, not just for me, not just for my channel, but either a client who wanted to sponsor content on my channel or a client who wanted me to produce content for their channel, I had to up my game. And so at that point, I started my production company and became a place that other, com that other companies could go to if they want the type of content that I do. And now I have ways to produce that in videos that are very low scale production, like The Naked Truth, where I just turn on my camera and go, or productions that are much more high in quality, some of which you'll see on my channel, some of which you'll see that I produced for other channels. And I now have the capability to do that too and the infrastructure to do that through my production company. So what is it like controlling your own content versus doing things for other people? Which do you prefer? I think everyone prefers controlling their own content because having that creative control is awesome. That being said, I have had some wonderful collaborative opportunities with clients who really get it, really understand the space and say, you know, this is the message we're trying to get across. And we understand that you make this type of content. So how can we merge those things into one thing that's even better? Like I love using sponsored videos or um, any type of funded content to do something more than what I can normally do. If I can take that and deliver something to my audience or their audience that has, that has extra than what I normally deliver, then I feel like that's a great relationship for everyone. Of course, you'll work with clients that maybe don't understand or are newer to the space and think, no, it has to be exactly this way that we said. And at that point, you become less of a creative producer and more of just a talking head like, all right, what would what do you think the video should look like? What do you think I should be saying in the video? I'll just do whatever you say. And at this point in my career, I really stay away from those jobs. They're not for me. I don't feel like it, it's me being genuine at all. And really, that's why I got into this in the first place. So I pass on those jobs and leave them for other people. But if it's a client that is willing to collaborate and a client that I truly believe in, I like to support products that I use myself then that's awesome. And if it can enhance my content, then great. And I love working with like right now, I work with Kingston Technology for their series DIY in five, where it's everyday tech tips for people who maybe don't feel like they're so tech savvy. How can they get better in this world? And uh, I absolutely love doing that series. Um, and Kingston's a great company that I've liked for years. So it makes sense.
So it's sponsored. Um, you know, it's very clearly that it's Kingston Tips. Um, it's it's for their channel. So that doesn't go on my channel. That's on their channel. So and then uh, how, how do you feel about like Patreon? Is that is that something that you also do or is it mostly just corporate sponsorships and YouTubes? I have not chosen to get into Patreon uh, at this point, but it's something that I've talked about with my community a lot because I want to know how they feel about it. I still feel very awkward about asking my viewers for money because that's not how YouTube was set up. You know, it's it's a place where you can consume content for free and that's awesome. And um, uh, Patreon, I think, offers a really, really nice system where you're still getting all of the content you were getting for free. But if you want to support it, here's a great way to do that. And YouTube tried to introduce something like that through their fan funding button. I don't necessarily know how many people are even aware that that exists um, or how often it's used. I do have fan funding enabled on my YouTube channel and I do uh, accept donations through my Twitch channel, but I don't really call out to them. It's kind of, you know, if, if people want to do that, then they seek it out on their own. Um, unless, of course, I'm doing a charity stream or something like that. And then, you know, I'm going crazy with the, it's for the kids, donate for the kids, like that kind of stuff. Um, but for me and to support my content, I prefer to do sponsored videos and work with clients of companies that I feel like I know these people have the marketing budget set aside for this already, as opposed to asking my viewers who may not have that kind of money at this point in their lives to donate. And, and if they do and they want to, that's amazing and that's lovely. Um, but I don't have something like a Patreon set up for that. And I've heard you talk about this a little bit too. And you also said, you know, that's, you don't really, you prefer watching ads uh, to content you like versus, you know, paying uh, for the content through a Patreon. Do you also feel, do you ever feel that it's different uh, for a woman in this space on Patreon than it is for a man? Um, well, oh, that's an interesting question. I've never thought of that. Um, I mean, it's a little different in that the types of entertainment that people produce, I feel like the the sex sells motif, um, uh, you would see more women making use of that strategy and that type of entertainment in this space than men. Not to say that there couldn't be, you know, a guy who starts a Patreon and is like, you know, if you donate a certain amount, I'll send a video of me oiling myself up or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Um, but sex sells in any entertainment and has in Hollywood for years, and that's nothing new. And I think that you do see people taking advantage of that in the digital space as well. And for me, you know, I kudos to those people. That's not the type of entertainment that I create. Um, so I, I don't know if maybe that's why people think, you know, it would be different. Patreon would be different for women. I also think that there's a lot more uh, judgment, unfortunately, for women who decide to start a Patreon because people are going to link it, whether we like it or not, to the idea of a webcam girl. You see that a lot with Twitch where I, I stream video games on Twitch. I do it for fun. It's awesome. It's like playing games with my friends. On I usually do it Sunday mornings. Um, but I see articles constantly of, you know, is Twitch bringing back the idea of the webcam girl for female streamers? And that's sad to me because not everyone is making entertainment that is specifically highlighting sexual things. And I think that the assumption that most women are is a little sad. Um, but like I said in the beginning of this conversation, the more people put out there who they truly are and make different types of entertainments, the, the more that I hope those preconceived notions will dissolve away a little bit. Right, exactly. I mean, if you watch your Twitch stream, um, which people should, uh, then you know that's <laughs> uh, if not... You like, if you like weird indie games, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you do. Like, it, it's funny because I, I read a question. Someone asked, like, why don't you stream Myst? Um, which, and you had a good answer to that. Um, we could talk about that. Like, it's, you know, all games uh, are not as uh, interesting to watch. Like, you know, talk about a little bit why you wouldn't want to stream a game of Myst. Now, see, I do actually stream games oh, of Oh, you do? Uh, I do. I stream, uh, I stream Myst. I've streamed, uh, I'm currently streaming Abduction, the spiritual successor to Myst created by Cyan. Um, and uh, I've streamed The Witness, which is Jonathan Blow's puzzle adventure game. Mm -hmm. And I think that most people would not want to stream that um, because it's a slower paced game. And a lot of people that are looking for content on Twitch want that fast pace. They want the action. They want the crazy reactions from the streamer. Um, and if I were thinking of my Twitch channel specifically 
as a business and it were, you know, I have to have to get ROI constantly, have to bring in the money, then maybe streaming Myst would not be the smartest move. Uh, because I'm doing it because I just love that game. Myst is actually my favorite video game of all time. Then I will play it because I feel like my viewers, A, my viewers get a kick out of watching me play something I super enjoy. And B, I hope that I'm educating people if they've never checked out this type of game before, that this is the type of game that they might really enjoy if they give it a chance. And it's it's a game type that I don't know that that many people glorify as much as they should. So I like to think I'm one of the one of the few that's glorifying those <laughs> games. Um, but yeah, strategically, it might not be the best business move to stream something <laughs> like that. And I really try to vary the types of games that I play on both my YouTube and Twitch channels so that there's a little something in there for everybody. However, again, if you're looking strategically as a business, that's not what I would recommend. If you were hiring my production company to consult for you, I would recommend that you pick one game and go crazy with that because just YouTube algorithm alone, they're going to push more heavily a channel that only plays Minecraft or a channel that only plays Diablo more so than a channel that plays lots of games and may have a Minecraft or a Diablo video. You also uh, streamed yourself playing Leisure Suit Larry with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> um, not as exciting as I thought it would be. So my parents are so funny. They are not gamers or entertainers at all. Like I'm the weird one in the family for sure. <laughs> and I somehow twisted their arm and I was like, come on guys, please play games on my stream. Everybody will love meeting you. It'll be so fun. And so they reluctantly agreed. And I thought, oh, it's going to be hilarious. I'm going to have them play Leisure Suit Larry Reloaded, the new one. Um, and, you know, it's a very risque game where you're in pursuit of love. And basically, you're this little guy who's just trying to get laid the whole game. And I thought, this is going to be so funny to have my parents play. And I mean, it was funny, but not in the way that I thought it would be. My parents were both very like, oh, mm -hmm, yes, I see. Like the whole time. I was expecting laughs. I was expecting them to be shocked by certain things. And they were both just kind of like, mm, okay, <laughs> for like two hours. What? I think my mom almost fell asleep at one point in the stream. <laughs> but those are my parents. That's real life. <laughs> what do they think of The Naked Truth? Uh, you know, my mom started off very much. So she's very conservative. And she started off very much like, please, please. Don't do that. Why are you doing this? It's giving me a heart attack. Um, but <laughs> over the years now, she is a viewer and she doesn't watch any of the ones that have to do with uh, relationship or sexual advice. She steers clear of those, but most of them she does watch and she really likes. And uh, she, you know, will call me and say, oh, I watched your video yesterday and I'm sorry you're going through that or, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, at first she was very like, I just don't understand how, why you have to be naked. I'm like, mom, well, I don't have to, but in some ways I do have to mom. Like that's, that's what I'm, that's what I've chosen to do. Well, it's, I mean, you, you have a lot of beautiful pictures of you on the internet. Like you do cosplay. You're in a lot of costumes. Like you've done photo shoots. Um, does she have issues with those as well? Yeah, she always did. Um, and a lot of the photo shoots and a lot of the more modeling type pictures you'll see online of me are from when I, before I started working online and creating digital content more when I was pursuing a traditional acting career. So I was doing more print jobs. I was going out for that kind of stuff. So I had an active modeling portfolio that I was using to get jobs. And that always felt very different to me because it wasn't me just saying, here I am, Trisha Hirschberger, mm -hmm. in like, I don't know, my bra and panties. It was like, you know, I've been hired to model for this swimsuit catalog. So here I am in a swimsuit <laughs> and I'm, I'm playing a role and I'm fulfilling a job obligation. And to me, there's a there's a big difference there rather than saying, you know, let me promote who I am as a person in this way. Uh, but I think that that line is absolutely different for everyone. And that line for my mother is much more on the conservative end than where that line is for me. And I know lots of people out here in Hollywood who, you know, are much more liberal on that and some of whom are much more conservative. And you just, you really got to do at the end of the day, what makes you happy and what makes you comfortable. And I always encourage people who are new to the industry to think about that and know that before you get into a casting situation where they may be asking you to do something that you're not comfortable with. Because in the moment, 
that's a lot scarier to try to figure out with all these external factors. It's much better to have it figured out so you have an answer going in. That uh, leads right into my next question. Is there anything that you would tell uh, the uh, you know twenty year old Trisha uh, about your career or twenty year old wannabe Trishas out there? Yeah. Uh, besides that, I mean that's great advice you've already given. But anything else that someone that wants to get uh, who is super geeky, loves gaming, loves any kind of you know technology, and wants to get in this space and feels a little afraid um, as a woman, is there any advice that you'd give uh, to them? The best thing I can say is be you. Uh, try to trust that there is an audience out there for exactly who you are. I think a lot of people get caught up. I especially did even in traditional media and more so in digital, trying to be what I thought they wanted me to be, whether that they is a digital audience, whether it's casting professionals, whether it's Hollywood, um, you know, I thought, oh, I, I have to be this and I have to be that. And I remember asking one of my professors in college, you know, oh, do you, is my nose too wide? Do you think I need a nose job? And he laughed and he said, Trisha, look, if you change too much about who you are, when the right job comes from for you, you won't be you anymore. And that will be heartbreaking. And I thought, you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, I've gone into conversations before where I thought I should change my last name for the industry. A lot of people change to an easier to pronounce stage name. Uh, but overall, the decision that I made for me was I'm just going to be me and that's going to be okay. And that's going to be enough. And the more that I can embrace that and do that, that's what makes me unique. That's what sets me apart is that I, we all are different from one another and what makes you different. That's what you can sell. That's what makes you special. And that's what you should create your content around. So yeah, that, that, that would be my advice. Be true to you. Make content that makes you happy. It's going to take a long time before you start seeing a return on investment for any of the stuff that you're making. If you're fortunate, it will happen sooner rather than later. But for me, I've been trying to take acting jobs, if I count theater that was paid, since I was 15. And I was not able to quit my day job until I was 28. So that's 13 years of really hard work of me dumping all the money I was making from waiting tables into new headshots, new reels. Now it's a lot of new equipment, lighting equipment, cameras, editing software, classes to learn how to use all that. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of time. But if you enjoy the journey, then it's totally worth it um, because then it then ultimately your feeling of self-worth and self-confidence doesn't hinge on other people telling you you've done a good job. You're in control of that. And that's the most important thing that there is in this industry. Well, Trisha, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, if anyone is interested in any of Trisha's work, she's Trisha Hirschberger. Uh, dot com. I think it was great that you didn't change your name. It's super easy to find you <laughs> online. If you had changed it to Clark or Smith or something, like you'd get, you know, you wouldn't have it for SEO purposes. Your name is perfect. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I wanted to change it. My middle name's Lynn. And I thought, oh, I'll just change it to Trisha Lynn. That's so much easier. And then I had friends at the time who were like, oh, you can't, you can't do that. There's a porn star who has a name that kind of sounds like that. And I said, okay, thank you for that information. I was not aware. Uh, so Trisha Hirschberger, it was. And, you know, if it makes, it may, if it makes me easier to find for people, that's awesome. Um, but seriously, Megan, thank you so much for having me on the show. It was lovely talking to you today. Oh. Uh, you're a delight. And it's an honor to talk to someone who's been working in the industry for as long as you have and been successful for as long as you have. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, you can find Trish at That Girl Trish, no I, uh, on Twitter. And uh, your YouTube is Nerdy Chick 8. Uh, no, it's at youtube.com slash Trisha Hirschberger. Oh, Hirschberger. Trisha Hirschberger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so youtube.com slash Trisha Hirschberger, twitch.tv slash Trisha Hirschberger. Um, and then Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat are all that girl, Trish, no I in the girl. All right. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks so much for joining us, Trisha. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Take care. And thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, we, uh, Leah, will be back for the next uh, triangulation. Um, and thanks for uh, letting me step in for him. I am at Megan Maroney on Twitter. You can email me always at Megan at twit.tv. And thanks for talking to us on triangulation. 